Welcome to 2001's Emily Review and Thoughts. If you'll excuse me. That's better. Or in the original French, Le Fabuleux Destin d'Emily Poulain. I think I did okay. It's been a while since I spoke French. Slightly belated Happy International Women's Day. And as you may know, March is National Disabilities Month, where we try to highlight positive depictions of people with disabilities. In this case, I'm talking about a movie that has a very positive and empathetic depiction of a neurodivergent person. I got the idea for talking about this particular movie from the Takes video, How Film and TV Misrepresented Neurodiversity. Emily has been armchair diagnosed as being somewhere on the spectrum, which makes a lot of sense, which I, I'm going to go more into detail with that, but first a few things to get to. So, I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the view, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. See its length, check the time codes in the description box. So if, for whatever reason, you find yourself doubting if you are a person or a golem, a, a being made of stone, this movie is a great test. If you watch this entire thing and feel nothing, you are made of stone. No matter how many times I watch this, I spend the entire thing going back and forth between smiling, laughing, going awe, Feeling sad for characters, just, yeah. So, I am going to say some things about France that might sound negative. I want to make sure to say, it comes from a place of love, not judgment. I'm, I'm being playful. So, content warning and or trigger warning. This movie features and or brings up the following, and I'm going to be discussing at least some of the following potentially triggering content. So, ableism gaslighting, xenophobia, suicide, and grief slash mourning, bullying and other abuse, mental illness, and yeah. For, for some of these I talk about if I think some of the potentially triggering content should have been removed. I think Arguments can be made for all of it, yeah, for, for keeping in all of it. Now, this movie is rated R, and so is this video. So that, I've seen a couple of people online mistake this movie for basically a, a family movie, maybe even a children's movie, and despite the fact that, you know, the protagonist has a vivid imagination and there are some, you know, there are some things about it that might make you think, you know, it's, it, it's not, it's not appropriate for children. It's, uh, yeah, the, 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 the MPA rated it R for the sexual content. Some of the dark comedy is also really not something that I would want to show a child. That's, yeah. Now, despite the length of this video, I am not going to go in depth about every single actor, everyone responsible for technical aspects. I will some, but, you know, people who have more experience on those undoubtedly will do. Now, I might say some negative things about people who don't particularly like this movie. I do want to be clear, I don't hate people who don't like this movie, and I don't think that people who... yeah, you know, no matter how much you... even people who absolutely hate this movie, you know, just you know, I'm, I'm fine with you. Now, most of what I said in, in my videos, 
is not meant to be statement of fact, but my personal opinion. I'm not saying that my personal opinion is any more correct than anyone else's. You know, the, the only stuff where I'm claiming to be stating facts is when, you know, I say stuff like the names of the people who made it. Now, I think that brings... Yeah, so, I'm currently dealing with some pain in my back and neck, so... Yeah, I but I still have a lot to say about the movies that I watch, so I might, at least in some parts of this video, speak faster until my back feels better. And... That brings us... Yeah, so, the review section of this video is going to contain no spoilers. If, if I decide I want to spoil something, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger while I am spoiling so you can mute and skip ahead once you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review set itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending and the... Yeah, I'm, I'm going to verbally let you know when I get into the thoughts, when I get into spoilers. Now, let's see that. It's us. Yeah, so this video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual, like clips from the movie, in another tab. I won't mind. Now, I'm probably not going to be saying very many negative things about this movie, but just in case. I got this on sale. So anything negative I say in this video, it's not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. And it's not that I'm upset at how it compares to some other movies made by some of the people who made this. Trailers. Yeah, to the best of my ability, the negative things I say in this video are fair criticisms based on budget when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. So that brings us to... Right. Since we're still dealing with Corona, I want to say during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I washed my hands since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again before going out. And let's see. Yeah, so my pronunciation of the French words in this video will probably not be great. It's been a lot of years since I was particularly convincing when I try speaking French, pronouncing French words. I'm confident that my old French teacher finds it just infinitely frustrating that my pronunciation is now so bad. But that's not the only reason that I'm no longer good at it. And yeah, I don't I'm not 100% sure if there actually is like an English dub of this movie, but you know, just in case, I'm basing this video on the original audio track with Danish subtitles since I dislike dub movies. So, so yeah, if I say something in this video that, you know, if I use words that might sound strange to you, it might just be that we watch two different versions of the subtitles, you know. I'm, I'm, Every, a, a lot of the things I say about this, I'm translating the Danish subtitles into English words. Now, I would say I've prob I, I don't have an exact count, but I must have watched this at least five, maybe as much as ten times total. And my first viewing was in the year two thousand and six. And. Honestly, I've I've kind of been looking for an excuse to do this movie, so you know, yeah, it it works out really well that the yeah. 
So, the plot. Paris, 1997. 23-year-old Emily tries to bring more happiness into the lives of the people around her, several of whom are lonely, and yeah, I think that is all I'm going to, yeah. So, as I mentioned, Emily has been armchair diagnosed as being somewhere on the spectrum, which makes a lot of sense. Well, I'm not saying that the following is true for all people on the spectrum. These are considered typical for many of them. She has an optimistic, idealistic, some would say naive view of the world. She's a very creative person, overflowing with empathy, has tremendous imagination. She has a very vivid inner life, despite her external life being largely unremarkable. Outside of the quirky, memorable people that she knows, there are a lot of unhappy people in her life. Frequently, it's because of bad or even no experiences with romantic love. Now, I'm sure there's a compelling movie in the narrative that disagrees with her, but a huge part of the reason that this movie is as amazing as it is, is that it is on her side. Where a lot of neurotypicals would see people that will simply, simply never know happiness, Emily sees people that she can help. She comes up with elaborate plans to help each and every one of them, individually tailored to each of them. She puts a lot of thought and love into them, and on multiple occasions it pays off. I won't give away if it always does. It's not that she never does something deliberately messed up, but it is always to get revenge on jerks who mistreat, mistreat the naive. She knows what a treasure neurodiverse people can be due to their perspective, which is hugely different from neurotypicals. There are countless movies about the differently abled that focus on people taking care of them. Now, obviously anyone who puts effort into improving the life of a differently abled person to say deserves respect, love, and support, especially the ones who make sure to do things that help the differently abled rather than just make themselves feel better. But I'm really glad that movies like this exist that express a deep appreciation for the neurodivergent themselves. There's almost nothing negative to say about it. More diversity would have been great. The movie's so white it's almost impossible to look directly at it. I've been a, I've I've gotten a few different you know, I've asked different people, including not a person, but I'll also ask Google. And as far as I've been able to to tell, there should be considerably more non-whites in the, the movie, considering that you know, this is one of the suburbs of Paris, Montmartre. And Let's see. Yeah, according to Wikipedia, the film was attacked by critic Sir... I'm going to go with Serge. Kaganski of Les Incroyables for an unrealistic and picturesque vision of a bygone French society with few ethnic minorities. Director Jeune dismissed the criticism by pointing out that the photo collection contains pictures of people from numerous ethnic backgrounds and that Jamel Debouze, who plays Lucien, is of Moroccan descent, and IMDb does say that he's of Moroccan descent, and I mean, okay, so it's it's good that there's numerous ethnic backgrounds in the collection, but like, I mean, I haven't counted exactly, but there's got to be at least a dozen characters in this that you like remember, and most of them are white. That is like. It's it's one of those things where I'm like, okay, if you if you're French and you find it very frustrating that you know there are so many non-whites in the the yeah in in France, I mean your ancestors were colonizers, so I don't know what exactly you want people today to do about that. Like that's that that might be one of the only. Most of this video is going to be a love fest. Honestly, it, you're you're either going to find it absolutely unbearable, or you're going to agree that the movie is amazing. Anyway, at least the protagonist is a woman, and the movie isn't afraid that a chunk of the male audience are going to be too intimidated by her confidence for them to enjoy them. I, I should say she's confident, but she is also shy. A number of straight men can't really handle women unless they're non-threatening. At best, these women are kind of hopeless on their own, badly need a man to fix them. Of course, they're just terrible, and we should all hate them for their feminine traits. And yeah, Emily is very... I mean, okay, so she's naive, and I 
I could understand a perspective that said that, yeah, you know, that the, the women in, in this movie are too dependent on love and, and, and men. Again, I think there is a, a compelling movie in one that challenges that more. But, the, I mean, I would say that it were a negative if the movie itself, like, if not for the fact that this is a movie that is in love with love. You know, this is not, the, the movie doesn't look down on them. I, honestly, if anything, it's probably more, like, a number of the female characters are more attuned to love than the male characters, and it's more a sense of, like, they understand it. You know, these these men that don't quite, they, they, they need, they need a woman to make, to help them understand love, you know, and if you don't understand love, then, you know, that, the, this film would say your, your life is a lot worse off without it. But yeah, it does also, like, there's, there's a lot of, heterosexuality going on, and that is obviously frustrating for those who are not straight, I, I'm i guessing. And again, I honestly, yeah, you know what? I'm 100% down for an LGBTQ plus, like, I mean, not remake, but spiritual successor to this movie. If that exists, please let me know down in the comments below. Now... Let's see. Yeah, and yeah, so an argument could be made that, you know, the, the, I guess, yeah, okay, so technically this is a spoiler. An argument could be made that nothing actually happens in this movie. It's not about what happens, it's about how much what little happens means to the main and major characters. And it is very accurate for, you know, pe people on the spectrum in real life, the, you know, what neurotypical people think is not important means the world to people on the spectrum. So, again, it is completely appropriate. No more spoilers for the time being. So, let's see. Yeah, this... Yeah, IMDb's more like this list compares this to Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which I rate an 8 out of 10, and that does make some sense, yes, absolutely. Requiem for a Dream, also an 8 out of 10. American Beauty. I guess I see it a little bit, like Life in the Suburb. Anyway, Life is Beautiful, or La Vita e Bella, which I rate an 8 out of 10 also. Leon the Professional, 8 out of 10. Pants Labyrinth, 8 out of 10. A Beautiful Mind, 8 out of 10. The Truman Show, 8 out of 10. Clockwork Orange, 8 out of 10, okay. Let's see. And The Pianist which I also give an 8 out of 10. Yeah. So, that brings us to the writing. Now, this was written by Jean-Pierre Jeuneux and Guillaume Laurent. I'm going to have to go ahead and guess. So, Jean-Pierre Jeuneux, wrote M movies with Mikey pointed out that you know they're they're listed Jean Pierre Jeune wrote the scenario and Laurent wrote dialogue and scenario and Mike movies with Mikey pointed out aren't all scripts you know don't they all boil down to dialogue and scenario you know maybe that's you know the 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 credits list them as writing 
scenario and dialogue. Yeah. So, Jean-Pierre Junot has also written Big Bug, which is in post-production The Young and Prodigious T.S. Spivet, Micmacs, A Very Long Engagement, The City of Lost Children, and Delicatessen. And Laurent has written... Yeah, they, they wrote some of these together. And they... They seem to make a good team. Now... Yeah, so the this has some really great writing. It, the 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 characters are very distinct. Like you feel after watching the movie, you feel like you know these people. Like it feels like these are just some of the people you've met in your real life. The you know they're they're. There's such a diversity, and everyone has their little quirks. It's a there's very little judgment in the movie. Like the only people that are depicted in a genuinely negative light are the ones who are cruel to the defenseless, whether that means children or the the you know disabled. Yeah, those are the only ones that the movie has no love for. You know, other than that, it really does, yeah, and the the various situations are also just so so you know amusingly crafted you can you can understand how these you know how we end up with these different situations. it's you know nothing is just completely out of nowhere there's always some kind of there's there's something that leads to the the things we see and we understand why although i'm you know i've i've read some reviews some some people found emily emily's shyness and uh, naivete and and emotional uh, let's go with a a lack of maturity and that's it's really a lack of experience she she doesn't have a lot of experience with like positive interactions with other people basically and some people found that very frustrating but that yeah there there are some some of the things that happen are specifically because she yeah she she acts based on her her shyness and yeah now, plot twists. There are definitely not too many plot twists. I would say all of the plot twists are good. I think some people might find there are too few. Like, there are plot points, there are plot developments, but there are few plot actual plot twists. It's not really about the plot twists. So, you know, if, if that's something that's important to you, then, yeah. And the, yeah, so this was directed by Jean-Pierre Junot. And let's see. So, yeah, other than this, he directed. Yeah, so yeah, once again, Big Bug, which is in post direction. Some music videos. The Young and Prodigious T.S. Spivet, Mick Max, Very Long Engagement. So, yeah, he's, he's written the. A number of the ones that he's directed as well. The City of Lost Children, and then I've, other than this, I've watched two of his movies, Alien Resurrection, which I think if you watch it as a sequel to the other Alien movies, I would probably give it a, a 5 out of 10, but if you watch it as this sort of almost like parody I'd, I'd give it an 8 out of 10. And, and certainly, like, the the technical aspects are very, like, the, the yeah, very, very well handled. And Delicatessen, which I would rate an 8 out of 10. And that is 
that is a very different movie than this in some ways. So if you watch this and you're like, what else? I, I want more. I need more Jean-Pierre Junot in my life. Delicatessen, I mean, I don't think I want to get into exactly what it's about in this video. What with the... I'm trying to keep a light tone here. So what I will say is... It's not quite the same, you know, if you, if you, it's not difficult to find out what it's about. So if you're, if you really want to find out if it's, you know, it's an excellent movie, but it is very different from this. Now, let's see. Yeah, so I already mentioned, you know, the 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 test with I forgot I wrote about this more than one part of my notes but yeah the the yeah I already mentioned the test of to see if you're a golem by watching this movie another thing if you can look directly at Emily's smile without like your just the, is, is that the phrase in, in English? Your heart melting? Your heart? I should not have written that note in Danish. Because I wrote it months ago and now I don't remember what the English version is. Without becoming affected. Let's go with that. I probably won't talk very much about Wes Anderson in this video. I do understand he was, you know, in, inspired by this movie. Which, you know, I... I uh, let's see, Wes Anderson. I think I've watched four of his movies, and I can definitely see the the inspiration. And he's tremendously talented. He's not. I I don't think his movies are really for me, but he is tremendously talented. Now the let's see. Yeah. So the the. The DVD comes with a an interview with the director, and he, yeah, it, it took him a while to come up with the right title. So he looked at old movie titles, and there was one that was called The Fabulous Destiny, and he thought that Destiny was, you know, extremely important to this movie, so, and, and it makes a lot of sense. Like, you know, some, some people know this movie just as, Emily, and it is, you know, that is less of a mouthful than the original full title. But it is, you you don't get the full weight of it either, if you only know it as Emily. And the first five months after the movie came out, he received somewhere between 500 and 600 letters some of them from lonely people who recognize themselves in Emily. Now, and, and the, like, there were magazines that would write about the movie, for example, how to dress like Emily. And the French president said, you know, told the director, watching the movie was one of the best nights he had ever experienced, which the director thought must mean he had a very sad life. But yeah, the president had a bad day when he watched the movie, and the movie put him in a really good mood, which 100, like, if you're having a bad day, maybe unless it's because you got broken up with, that might not, then it might, I mean, depending on who, some, some people it might be, you know, for, for some people it might make them think, I'll find love again. But for others, it might not be the best idea. But other than that, like, yeah, it's it's really a movie to put you in, in a good mood. And, and it, you know, I'm, I'm not, not every movie has to be. A lot of my favorite movies are very downer movies. But, yeah, this is, I think this might, uh, I guess overall my favorite put you in a good mood movie is probably the first Blues Brothers. But I think this comes in at a very close second. And that's not like it's it's not really fair to compare other movies to that one. It's just everything about that 
movie works. Anyway, and yeah, so the director uh, said that most of what was written about the movie was positive, and the cafe that chunks of the movie take place, you know, she works in this cafe. The, the owner was actually going to sell the cafe, but then it got so much positive attention that his life completely changed after the movie came, because everyone wanted to come see where the movie was filmed. From all over the world, they come to visit, but that all, you know, the, the, the price of housing has already, has also risen in that area, and the cafe owner believes that is the director's fault. Now, yeah, so, I'm going to quote a little from my review from 2006. The film captured me immediately with its unique style and the interesting and amusing storytelling. Junot has a particular, peculiar style and an unusual, occasionally bordering on the downright bizarre sense of humor. The film clearly doesn't take place in our world. The line between the real and that which is fantasy is blurred to the point in which it doesn't exist. I found this quite charming. Everything is pretty and has a magical reason behind it. There's this really sweet moment early on where one example of Emily's imagination is that she she figures that this is gonna make this is gonna make me sound old because I actually know what it is, and it's gonna make some people in the audience feel very old if they know what it is. LP records. Emily thinks that you make uh, an LP record the same way you make a pancake. You know, you, you got the batter, you pour it into the, the, the pan, and then you uh, uh, flatten it out, and there you have a record. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's such a sweet way, of, you know, keeping in mind she's like eight when she thinks of this. Now, I'm going to quote a few fellow critics. It's like a comic book come to life. The director can do very bright, like he does here. Dark, like he does in Delicatessen and Alien Resurrection. There's hardly a static camera shot in the entire film. The camera is always moving. Everyone had to work hard to keep the movie from looking tacky. When making Alien Resurrection, the director was forced to play by Hollywood rules. When he made this movie, he did not. And you can tell he's so much more free here. And the actress is 100% perfect for the role. And, yeah, the, the, the critic mentions, the, you know, Life is Beautiful is another movie that perfectly captures a positive view of the world. And I've, I've heard some criticism of, of that movie, considering what it, what it depicts, when it's, when and where it's set. And, and the positive outlook that it maintains. I'm not going to get into that here. I do understand that perspective as well. I gotta say, personally, like, I must have watched that movie at least four times, and each time it was just... Yeah, I, I really love that movie. That, that, might, that might be number three on the, on the list of, of, you know, movies to, to put you in a good mood if, if you're, yeah. And, yeah, back to critics. Most everyone who can watch this should, however. It is a welcome trip back to one's childhood with the imaginative visuals and soft light tone. Acting, editing, score, basically everything seemed flawless to me. A ravishing hybrid of hyperactive cartoon and magic realism, Emily jumps from the screen like a pop-up storybook rendering other stories dull and flat by comparison. There really aren't that many movies made at this level of achievement whose subject matter and tone both support the idea that the world and the person, in it, the people in it, are basically good. Not only is it a fawning love letter to the city of light where it was shot, but the film is based on the comforting premise that the big city is just a small town when folks get to know each other. Emily contains enough material for a dozen or so charming shorts. And, yeah, it's, okay, I'm, in the interest of, of giving a little air, air time to, to other perspectives, 
Yeah, this critic goes on to say, stretched, but stretched to feature length, the whimsy grows wearisome and the film delights far less than it seems to desire. I hugely disagree with that, but for sure that is the experience that some people will have. The result is hip nostalgia, a postmodern fairy tale in which faith is replaced by predestination or simple luck, and the universe proves against all odds to be a place of kindness and abiding love. The whimsical French comedy about the ramifications of clandestine good deeds and the courage to follow one's own heart is also a celebration of the boundless potential of cinema itself. A romantic comedy that stubbornly refuses to play by the rules, Emily could be this generation's breakfast at Tiffany's. It is... Uh, let's see. Yeah, okay. Again, the following I hugely disagree with, but some people will agree. It is overwritten and overdirected for the quaint, simple feelings it attempts to project. And back to reviews that I do agree with. Filled with airy whimsical charm, the way um, a chocolate souffle is filled with air, Audrey Tattoo is right for the role. A perfect ga gamin in a Lulu haircut. Writer director Jean Pierre Genoux gives the story a feeling somewhere between a fairy tale and documentary. His behind the scenes glimpses of the characters' likes and dislikes, from cleaning out a toolbox and getting fingers pruny in the bath to sticking a hand in a barrel of grain and cracking the sugar on a creme brulee are particular and somehow very touching. European cinema has never had the importance and visibility of American films. It lacks the money and power of large corporations of Hollywood able to invest billions in a film and all the merchandising and advertising that it usually takes. But sometimes this lack proves to be a quality for European cinema, which increasing, increasingly focus on quality, artistic care, and the beauty of art. This is the case of this film, exceptionally beautiful and striking. Now, let's see. So, apparently, according to Wikipedia, there is a musical adaptation of this, and Juno has distanced himself from the musical due to his distaste for the art form, saying he only sold the rights to raise funds for children's charity. Okay. Methana Zikugi Cardiac. Oh, like a cardiac issue for children. Oh, yeah. And, oh, which is actually, that's... Emily's father mistakenly it diagnoses her as having cardiac issues. So that's why it was that particular charity that he chose. Alan Morrison from Empire Online gave Emily five stars and called it one of the year's best with crossover potential along the lines of Cyrano de Bergerac and El Postino. Given its quirky heart, it might well surpass them all. Paul Tatar of CNN praised Emily's playful nature in his review. He wrote, Its whimsical, free-ranging nature is often enchanting. The first hour in particular is brimming with amiable, sardonic laughs. A lot of the characters, the first time we meet them, we are told their various quirks. As already mentioned, you know, things they like, things they dislike, which it's, it's amusing, it's very humanizing. And, like, when... when you know, the first people that this is done for are both of Emily's parents. And we find that they're both these very detail-oriented, perfectionist, neurotic kind of people where, like, they're... His favorite thing is emptying out his toolbox, cleaning it, and carefully putting all of the tools back in order. One of her favorite things is emptying out her bag, cleaning it, and carefully putting back all of the, the stuff she was carrying, you know. So it's, you, you can really understand why they fell for each other. This is a movie where powerful personal experiences, memories, and emotions are made as big by the movie as they feel to the characters. It's not about perfect and imperfect people, 
everybody in this has some quirk, some imperfection, and it's not about, oh, it would be great if they would just change. You know, a, a lot of American movies, especially ones about love, are about you got to meet the perfect person and then be perfect for them. You know, the, the, if, if only this particular thing, you know, now to, to some of the people in this movie, the, the person that they're in love with, you know, to, to them, they might seem perfect. You know, we, as, as the, the viewer, as, as the audience of the film, you know, we get to see everybody's quirks. So we never really think that anybody is perfect. But, again, the movie says that's fine. You know, nobody is perfect, period, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I mean, if, if anything, it, it basically says focus on the things where you, you have common interests. Focus on the things that you like that the other person likes. And the movie literally opens on the conception and then birth of Emily. And that is where, like, immediately, like, a, I think it might have been intentional. A chunk of the American audience is immediately going to be like, okay, that's way too Like, you don't see anything, you know. But, yeah, you know, you see, you see the, 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 the sperm and the egg, you know. And then you see the, the newborn baby but that alone will be you know some some american audiences just immediately bulk and then hopefully clean up after themselves and the opening titles are of eight-year-old emily doing cutesy child things like she she paints or paints she she draws like a, a mouth on her like you know, lips and, and eyes and does the, the speaking thing. I'm, I'm not saying only children enjoy that, but, you know. I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad, but it definitely, it fits what with what came before. I think the ending is perfect. There is not, uh, yeah, no Deus Ex Machina. <sighs> Convenient writing, I mean, basically everything in the movie, like, you know, some people are going to find it frustrating, but really the movie is trying to say, destiny wants people to be happy. Destiny wants people to fall in love and, and you know, be happy together. And that's why the things, but, but yeah, you know, if you, if you want to get technical, if you want to be 100% brutally just detached and honest about it, I guess it technically qualifies as convenient writing, but I think it's, I, I, I think it should. I'm, I'm glad that it, it does. And yeah, the ending titles leaves you with, with the same emotion as the ending causes was following up. On the ending. This is one of those movies that understands that opening credits and ending credits, I mean, in a very technical legal sense, yes, they are required. But that doesn't mean that they have to be boring. That doesn't mean that they're just some throwaway thing that just, you know, up, oh, guess a couple minutes are going to pass before it you know, before we get to enjoy what is on screen in front of us again. Now, for some people, you know, some people have experienced losing interest along the way of, of watching this movie. I never have, and I, you know, I... I remember everything that, you know, like, like, there was a, ch a chunk in my life where I didn't really watch this very often, and I still never forgot the stuff in the movie, like, you know, the, the, uh, the times in my life where I was with a partner was happy, and the times in my life where I, you know, like now, do not have a partner, 
yeah, I, I can't explain. Somehow, I always love this movie. I, I, yeah, so, so, even watching the movie, even, even re-watching the movie over and over again, knowing everything that's coming, I still never, it still, still never loses my interest. I suppose, technically speaking, there probably are some parts of the movie that are stronger than others. Now. That brings us to the characters. Audrey Tatu as M Emily Poulain. And she's essentially a manic pixie dream girl. But the story is told from her point of view. We know more about her than we do him. So that does help things. You know, a, a lot of the time, I realize not everybody thinks so, but the Manic Pixie Dream Girl, if, if the story is told from the guy's point of view, then the Manic Pixie Dream Girl is just, you know, it's just a different version of, you know, some people prefer the, the kind of, perfect, you know, she has no flaws girl, but other guys prefer the Manic Pixie Dream Girl, she's still the Dream Girl, she's still, the the way she is depicted is the, the way that he wants her to be, but in this one, it's not really, you know, we, we have more, we, we, I would say overall, we we have more empathy for her. It's it's not that we don't have empathy for him, but we don't know as much about him. It it isn't it isn't told as much from his perspective. Now they have scenes where he's there and she isn't, but it it is primarily her. And yeah, really, if. And, and again, you know, one of the problems with some of these very male-driven romantic comedies is that it is, you know, he wants her, and he has to convince her that they should be together. But in this one, they do both, you know, both of them really are interested in the other. Now, according to Wikipedia, in his DVD commentary, Juno explains that he originally wrote the role of Emily for the English actress Emily Watson, which might explain the name. In that first draft, Emily's father was an Englishman living in London. However, Watson's French was not strong when she became unavailable to shoot the film, owing to a conflict with the filming of Gosford Park. Junot rewrote the screenplay for French actress Audrey Tautou was the first actress he auditioned, having seen her on the poster for the 1999 film Venus Venus Beauty Institute. And, yeah, quoting from a critic, Tattoo is a remarkable young actress. Her wide-eyed gammon look, reminiscent of a young Audrey Hepburn or Leslie Heron, gives Emily an innocence and vulnerability that is so essential to make the story work. And, yeah, she's she's absolutely adorable. Like, the the... When you watch this movie, you do, you 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 can become nostalgic for when you thought the way that that she does, and and for a lot of people that will be just childhood, not not even young adulthood, but you know ch childhood before even teenager, the teenage years. It's just like she's. The, the the imagination on display, how charming she is, how she really does just, you know, like, she doesn't care about class. She, she sees people who deserve happiness, and occasionally she sees cruel people that, you know, if, if they... If they are especially cruel, if they, 
and and especially the ones who continue to be cruel she will you know devise some sort of punishment for them but there really isn't you know like that it, you know obviously that is a bit of a of a privileged position but like money doesn't really come up like there's no n nobody yeah I didn't, no yeah i don't think a single character in this is like dreaming of being rich or or something like that the you know it's it's about trying to trying to find love trying to find meaning yeah and flora Gye plays young emily which I, I would say she must be around eight she is just absolutely adorable like the the i've talked before about i i don't love the idea of child like child acting as a concept i kind of feel like let's just let's give people a normal childhood and then like once they become adults if they want to act then the you know but she's she's just unbelievably adorable and and the the like she's she's got such an expressive face like when she when she's like sad you can really see it and and like her her smile just beaming and and when she's like, like there's this bit where she's like sitting and watching tv and she sees about all these terrible accidents and just the look on her face is just like she like it it just hit her how bad some things in in the the yeah you know sometimes really bad things happen in the world okay i'm going to go ahead and guess it's pronounced Matthew Kasowitz plays Nino Kim Kim Kam Hua. Thankfully, that one was pronounced in the movie. So that that one, Kim Kam Pong Kim. Yeah, okay, I got it once. That's gonna have to do. He is a bit of a dreamer himself, and yeah, it's not a spoiler to say, you know, he's the one that. He and Emily really find each other very I mean I feel like the word attractive isn't quite right appealing charming like they they just they become enamored with each other and really want to try to have a a relationship but they are also both very shy and he has this thing where, like, he wants to connect more with other people, but he's, he's shy. He has a difficult time of it. So what he does is he will go to the, the various... I'm going to go ahead and just describe it because I don't know what the English word for it is. Passport photo booths. I, yeah. And he, he has this, like, uh, I guess it's, it's probably some kind of kitchen thing. It, like, like this, this long, uh, um, it's not it's not like sharp it's not a knife but but so, something with that general and he he slides it under these booths and the, the the he yeah he he uses it to to drag to in yeah to to out so so he can pick them up these ripped up pass you know passport photos and he tapes them together and he has this like photo album of all of these people that he doesn't know and he'll never meet but there are these you know like it's it's these f photos of people 
you know, yeah, pe people who took these these photos of themselves and ended up unhappy with the result for whatever reason, and instead of keeping them, you know, ripped them up and and yeah, they ended up down under there, you know. So he he kind of he sees people in in a vulnerable state, but in a non creepy. I guess this, some people would probably consider it creepy, but you know he he's not. It's not some kind of weird thing for him. It's just you know he he has an easier time of that than going up and and actually you know going up to people and meeting them, you know and. Yeah, obviously this is something that where where Emily, you know, once she becomes aware that that's something that he does, you know, she knows that that's something she, he's someone that she would just want to meet, you know. And th there's actually this this really sweet bit where like she was homeschooled, which is part of why she has such difficulty with other people. He went to a normal school, but he was bullied. And there's this bit where you see, you know, eight-year-old her and eight-year-old him in different parts of Paris. I'm not 100% certain if it's different parts of Montmartre, but different parts of Paris. And both, and, and the, the narrator explains that he was hoping for a sister and she was hoping for a brother because both of them were so lonely. And, you know, yeah. And he's he's legitimately very charming. And Amari Bebel plays young Nino. We don't he does not get a lot of screen time, but he is like he is convincing in, in the little bit. Yeah. The narrator isn't a character, but he is important. So Andre Dussoyer. He is remarkable, like the, the just immense talent. Like I, if I spoke French, I would want an audio, I, I would want 20 audiobooks with this kid. I, I, some people are going to watch this movie and take up learning French so that they could understand every word he says in, in this. He just, yeah. And Rufus, I, I guess that's an artist's name. It it don't, it just says Rufus plays Raphael Poulon, Emily's father, and I already mentioned that his one of his favorite things is the the yeah emptying out his toolbox, cleaning it, carefully putting all the tools back in, and yeah he's you know he is tremendously neurotic and just like he's he's not good at expressing love he does love emily but he's not you know like like a lot of fathers maybe especially maybe especially towards girls but then for others, especially towards their sons. Anyway, he he's just not good at, at expressing it. But yeah, you you it it is this this sort of yeah. I'm I'm just briefly going to talk about that he he has this garden gnome and Emily. I guess I'm not going to give away exactly what. I'm just going to say that she thinks that the the garden gnome maybe not maybe not put in the in the place that would be best to to keep it. So she decides to do something about that. And that's all I will say without spoilers. Serge Merlin plays Raymond Dufayel, 
sometimes referred to as the glass man. He has this condition where his bones are very frail, so he stays in his apartment at all times. And Emily comes over every so often. He he has this he he keeps repainting the same painting over and over and he and Emily basically both think that it would be good for her if she could go out and and connect with you know the the it it would be good if she had someone that she could you know where she could really be completely herself, which uh, a boyfriend, and because she is so shy, and he realizes that, you know that that is something that a, a lot of a lot of physically handicapped, especially ones who need a lot of help from other people, they they come to to learn that. You know, a lot of people are, they, they, they have to be very careful not to upset these people because they'll be less likely to come back to help them again. And this combination, her shyness and his strategy, let's go with that mean that they can communicate in this sort of less direct verbal way that when he has advice for her he will you know he'll he'll indicate one of the one of the women in the painting and he'll say you know what i think i th i think i know what would be a good idea for what what she should do to to approach this situation and she'll say, you know, I ah uh, that that sounds like it might make sense. But I think if you asked her directly, what she might say to that advice is this, you know, so so they're not they both know what they're talking about. But they don't have to it it doesn't have to be you know, she doesn't have to say, I need this, and he doesn't have to say I think you should, you know, so, and, um, he, uh, a, a character that I will mention, that I, that I will also get into very soon, brings him groceries, and, and he is instructing the, the guy who brings him groceries, he's, he's helping him learn to, to draw, and, Dufayel also, he has this, this camera, and I guess I'm going to, yeah, and there, I, I, I will, I will simply say, there are some significant tapes, VHS tapes, time to feel old again that he watches and yes that's what I will. and Lorella Cravota plays Amandine Poulain Emily's mother and also very neurotic and there's this there's this really darkly comedic bit where the the Emily's best friend in the whole world is this goldfish but the goldfish the narrator explains has become distraught because of the tension in this household so it grows suicidal so we see it jump from the little the little goldfish um yeah aquarium I guess jump out of there and then it's like you know fla yeah flapping flipping around on the floor 
And eight-year-old Emily, she is just horrified. So she's like screaming at the top of her lungs, which obviously makes her very neurotic mother extremely upset. So she screams. And the poor, you know, the, the father has to like, I think it's that, you know, after flipping around on the floor a little bit, it ends up under one of the, like, like a, a cabinet or something. And the father has to grab like a, a this long tool and, and like try to get the fish back out of the, you know, and, and he finally gets it and picks it up, plops it back in the aquarium. And then to make sure it doesn't happen again, he puts several books on top of the aquarium and like this this heavy thing on top so it can't do it again. You know, but ultimately the they simply can't keep the the pet. So and and that's actually what leads to to Emily having having absolutely no friends and having to you know Get, developing this overactive imagination where you know her, her father's a, a doctor and she imagines she herself as a doctor and she's like you know got the stethoscope and she's like checking the the heartbeat of this i forget exactly i want to say is it is it maybe a crocodile a, a very like heavy crocodile and you know she puts the the stethoscope and she's listening and then she takes it down, she's like, and she doesn't say anything, but we're like, holy crap, is she, is she gonna, is she delivering some very heartbreaking news to this imaginary, because, you know, every so often she must hear about her father having to deliver very bad news, so she, you know, that's, that's, that becomes part of her imagine, it just, yeah, and it's this little eight-year-old with, with this, so it just, Adorable, absolutely adorable. Moving on. Clotilde Mollet plays, I guess, Gina, a fellow waitress at the Café de Deux Moulins. And she has this... She's basically like a, a physical therapist, chiropractor, kind of... So like people will come to this cafe and they'll like sit there with some, something to drink or something and she'll like be oh you know ah got 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 some you know have a little bit in in your neck and she'll you know grab and and and, and you know up oh, you got something in your finger and there it goes you know just and it's just like you you're sitting there like what am I what am I watching how is this how is this happening right now? And it's just, yeah. And, and, yeah, she's just, I suppose I will briefly, yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, she is unfortunate enough that, that she is, like, there's this, this guy who comes to the, the cafe very frequently, Joseph, which I'll get into briefly, and he, the, you know, the two of them used to be together, but then he became re really, really jealous. So now they're not together. And he's like, record, he's got this little recorder, re recording device, and he'll record her laugh and then like rewind it and listen to it and be like, now, let's see, is that a postcoital or pre wedding laugh? And just like, yeah, which which obviously is very frustrating for her. And Claire Moyer plays Suzanne, the owner of Café de du Moulin. And yeah, she's you know she's had some experiences. She 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 used to be with a trapeze artist, and. She explains that you have to be careful with them because they'll let you go at the very last moment. And the there was she she was involved in in an accident, and that's that's why she now owns this cafe instead of you know being of a, a uh, not necessarily a trapeze artist, but 
you know, a, a more physical, yeah, you know, so it's, and it's, again, this thing, like, like, you know, some people who own a cafe, it's not, they haven't necessarily had the most exciting life, but it's like, wow, that is like, okay, I have never in my life had as, an as exciting of an experience as this one that she, you know, yeah, she, she, she doesn't even make that big of a deal out of it. Isabelle Nanty plays Georgette, which Wikipedia describes as the resident hypochondriac, which, like, there's, yeah, she, if, if, if there is a disease out there that she doesn't have, then it's because she just hasn't caught it yet. Give it time, you know, it's, Actually, you know what? She probably has caught it already. The doctor just haven't diagnosed it yet. That's all. And, like, just... There's this early bit where, where like, someone comes in to buy cigarettes. And that's... You know, she's, she stands there, she sells cigarettes. And, like, you know, she's she's asked to, to get this specific brand of cigarettes. And she's like, oh, it's it's so smoky here. Can you can you and and you know we and the the customer is like, what are you talking? Like the customer doesn't say it, but it's clearly thinking, what is she what is she talking about? There's no smoke here, and and you know the the let's see yeah she she ends up indicating okay it's that that one okay ah uh, where where are the one franc coins? You know what? Never mind. I'll get my cigarettes out there. <laughs> Just and. Yeah, she's, she's, it's, it's, you know, at, at one point she's, so, someone pays her a compliment and, and, you know, she, yeah, he, he says, you look beautiful when you blush. And she's like, no, no, I have, I have a skin condition. Just, yeah. And Dominique Pignon plays Joseph. And Joseph? No, wait, no, that's. See, I, the thing is, I don't remember how they pronounce it in the movie. I'm going to go with Joseph for now. He appears in everything that Juno directs, and you can understand why. He's incredibly talented, versatile. He plays some very different roles in these movies. In Delicatessen, he's even the lead. Like, if you've watched Alien Resurrection, he's that weird mechanic guy. You know, uh, what is it that he says again? Who has... What... what? Who has two thumbs and screws like a machine or something like that? And then he, you know, holds up. He he uses his thumbs to, you know, this guy's. Yeah, very very different from anyway. But yeah, he's he's just ridiculously jealous. And Emily decides that, you know what, Joseph and Georgette. They could probably be pretty good together. So, you know, she convinces both of them that the other one is already interested in them. Which, of course, you know, at that point, it's like, I mean, maybe. I mean, if they're already interested, then I'm not really... What do I have to lose at that point? I, if they're already interested, it's, it's an open invitation. It's a free meal. I'm going to try it. What's what's the worst that could happen, you know? And they're just they're they're adorable together. Like there's this bit where you know he's he he wants to try to get in contact with her. So again, this is this is you know this it it couldn't be more obvious. It's just it's a it's a freebie. He goes up and he asks to buy something, you know. Then they're in, then they're having a conversation. And the, you know, he, he buys one of those, uh, I forget what they're called, Sc scratch thing, you know, where you can win money, you know. And, you know, he, yeah, so he, he gets one and then he's like, ah, oh, you know, I, I don't actually know how to, how to do one of these. Do, do you know how to do it? And, and she's like, you know what? I've never tried myself either, but I, th I think I, th I think I know how to. We can do it together, you know. And and they're both, you know, they they scratch it off, 
And I'm like, mm, you know, I, I didn't win anything. Did, did you watch? No, nah, me neither. But uh, you know what they say: if you're unlucky in, you know, then you might be lucky in love. And it's just, it's just they're so adorable together. You know, I mean, if I had to guess, they must be like in their thirties, but they look like a couple of teenagers flirting with their first love. It's just, it's adorable. The, the, yeah, and, and he's the one who says, you know, I think his, his exact words are, when you, when you smile, you're like a, a, you know, a flower in the field in full bloom. And she responds, oh, I, I have a condition where I swallow air. You know, just. <laughs> and Artu de Penguin, as Hippolito, the writer and yeah, he's just, you know, he's he's a hopeless optimist, and he's like, you know, he's, he struggles to sell, but he doesn't, that doesn't mean that he's going to give up. And Yolande Moreau as Madeline Wallace, or in the English subtitle versions, Wells. And she, you know, the, the first time that we meet her, one of the first times that Emily interacts with her, clearly, based on the, the way it goes, something happens that I think happens pretty much every time she meets a new person. Emily just, you know, she, she just asks for some information. She, she's not, she's not asking for her life story, but that's kind of, Okay, she doesn't get the entire thing, but she gets the most significant part. She apparently Madeline used to be with this this guy. I I struggle to remember his name. Let's see. Um, I think it's something like Andre. I'm gonna go with Andre, and. Yeah, Andre, you know, they were they were deeply in love and he wrote her love letters from when he was, you know, when he had military service. And you know, the the later on he started you know, he started sleeping with another woman and she demanded that they only have sex in the most expensive hotels. And Madeline says they must have had sex in every single of the most expensive hotels. And he would, to pay for it, he would steal from the, the till. And one day he stole, what was it, 50,000 francs or something like that. And so they eloped together. And, you know, now she's alone. She's been alone for many years. And everybody around there knows about, you know, because... You know, she's she's lived in the same place for a long time, so it's it's gotten around and yeah. And yeah, it's just this like you you really like you really empathize with her. It it's it's the kind of thing where a lot of people yeah, honestly, I could imagine there there are probably some people who watch it and are like, "Oh, lady, get over it." It was like, if if I let's see, if I understand correctly, I think that happened in like '64, and once again, the movie itself takes place in 1997, so 33 years—that's a long time. And she still she still has his picture up on the wall, and his love letters are are bound in a in a in a thick pile and she has them very close by you know so so clearly she's never really gotten over him you know and somehow the movie you know the movie itself has tremendous empathy for her and i can only you know i can't speak for other people but i've always found like you i personally really empathize with her everybody everyone every without exception everyone that i've shown this movie to which must be about a dozen people at least all of them have said oh you really you feel so bad for her 
and Urbain Jean uh, Cancelier plays Collignon, the grocer, and he's just he's he's really really cruel to his assistant, and because of this, Emily decides that maybe you know maybe he needs to learn a little more empathy and so she goes about teaching empathy and i suppose i won't give many details well, what i'll say is it starts with her like at, at first it's just you know they live in the same apartment building one day, as she's walking down the stairs, she notices he forgot to take his keys with him. And at first, she's going to give him the keys. She's just, like, she, she's about to give him the keys. And he's like, oh, oh just, just one minute, young lady. And then he proceeds to say something really cruel, not just about, but directly to his assistant. You know, it's, it's, it's that thing of, like, is, is it better or worse? If they're present to hear the mean thing, but, you know, yeah, he, he does. And so she changes her mind and she gets a copy made of his key. And then she, when, when she knows that he's not at home, you know, he stands at the, the you know, yeah, it's, it's not difficult to tell. She, she passes by the grocer and he's either there or he isn't. She unlocks the door, and she goes in, and you can tell that he's a person who takes tremendous comfort in things being predictable, things being the, you know, the, the things should be in a, in a certain way so that he doesn't have to, you know, so he can just relax and, and rely on things being the way they're supposed to be. Because he's very careful, very particular in making sure that things are the way they should be. And she goes in and, and you know, changes around some, thing, some things. And that is clearly very... Yeah, he is, he is not a fan of that. Now... But I, uh, I'm wondering if I... If I made it completely clear, let me, yeah, to, to add a few more details. She, she goes in, you know, she unlocks the door, goes in, changes some things around, then, you know, leaves, locks the door again. So when he just gets there, he doesn't realize that and there's anything different. And, you know, one of the things she does is he has his slippers in, you know, in a specific spot near his... Ah, what's it called? He's got like a, a great chair for like relaxing. I, I don't know what it's called in English. You know, he's he sits down there, he's he takes he you know, takes off his shoes, puts on his slippers, and she replaces them with a pair that's too small. Which isn't visible, but you you know, the moment he tries to squeeze his feet into them, he can tell. No, that's that's the wrong size. Or, 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 yeah. And and to him, like, nobody's been here because the door was locked. I have the only key. I don't... How did this happen? You know, and just... Yeah. And... Chamel de Beauze plays Lucien, the grocer's assistant. Now, he's the one that is cruel too and he he is a, a very sensitive person and I I don't know what it's called but he has some uh, he has a, a physical uh, thing with with one of his his hands so he has to just use the one hand and you know in in part that can mean that he you know he he can't 
you know, when he's when he's handing out the vegetables and such, ba bagging the vegetables, this kind of thing. Obviously, he can't work quite as fast as someone who can use both hands. So, yeah, you know, it's it's that's very understandable, and we as the audience empathize with him. Gourmillon has no empathy or patience, you know, empathy for him, patience with him whatsoever. And that makes us and Emily really resent Collignon and, yeah, hence the, the revenge. And, yeah, so, Maurice Benichon plays Dominique Bretodeau, and there's this bit where he gets, yeah, it's, it's not a spoiler, it, it's... Emily finds this this little box of, of childhood memorabilia and it's it's clear that that was something that you know Bretodeau hid when he was a child and then he was like they they must have like moved apartments and he wasn't able to retrieve it something like that and you know now he's like 50 something 60 something and you know, she finds it, finds out that it was, you know, she has to do a tiny detective work to, to find out who, and she gets it to him, and he becomes completely overwhelmed with emotion, and he's like, I, sh I should, I should talk to my daughter again, and, and just, yeah, it's, it's, just, it's really, really sweet. And, yeah, we get this brief flashback to Kevin Fernandez playing young Dominique and there's this thing where he like he played ah I should have written down it's in let's see in English it's called marbles I want to say with the yeah with the little glass balls that you you know you have to like I forget, do you throw them or do you roll them, but, you know, something. And you have to hit the other ones to win. And apparently one day he won all of the marbles. Like, his entire class, he won their marbles. And then, like, the teacher is yelling at them to get in line. Uh, you know, the, the, this whole thing ta taking place in, I want to say, in scene 53, so, somewhere about there, you know. So... You know, he, he's trying to comply with the teacher, but he needs those marbles. He, he won all those marbles. So he grabs them and he puts them in his pocket. And, like, the teacher gets really angry with him, you know, takes him by the ear and starts, you know, dragging him over to, to where the other kids are. And then, you know, as the narrator explains, the most horrible thing happened. His, his pockets... And, you know, his pants pockets split because they're not made for that many marbles. I, I mean, if I had to guess, there has to be several dozen marbles there. And he's, he's trying to stuff them into these two pockets. And so the pants, the, yeah, the, the pockets rip and the marbles go everywhere. And so he loses a bunch of them. And it's this thing where, like, you know, you could imagine how that, like, you know, as, as a kid, he must have been like, no. You know that that's like like the the worst thing he could imagine has just happened, and and yeah, it's just yeah. And my uh, Michel Robin plays Mister Cognon, so Cognon's father, and there's this thing about how he used to stamp stamp. I'm gonna go with stamp tickets. In like uh, food, yeah. What's that called in English? I mean, not like a regular train, I don't think, but like the the kind where they have the the little there's the the indentation in the in the street, and it follows that indentation. Yeah, it is not a big deal anyway. Trains. He would he would go in he would, you know get people's tickets and you know stand yeah 
put put a little hole in to show okay ticket has been accepted and you know that yeah and and now where he's a senior freaking citizen he's <laughs> sometimes he'll get up at night early and and he'll go out and he'll he'll stamp his wife's um some some of her plants and so she she's like look look at what he does to my plants and it, she'll show emily these these uh, you know uh uh leaves that he's he's stamped multiple times because it's still you know he's he's having trouble letting go you know cuz he did this for like decades and it was it was every single day so so it's it's deep with and and it's such like we get this you know tiny little glimpse into because that is like a lot of people have difficulty retiring adjusting to retire to, to life as a retiree and yeah that that is the kind of thing you know sometimes they will have trouble completely letting go of of that kind of thing and he 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 tells emily you know when when emily comes to ask the the you know his wife immediately leaves for the for the ah uh, what's it called the the f folder i guess where the information is for, because important bit of context that i should mention they know who lived in the apartment where emily found the little box of, of childhood toys Th this is how she finds out about bretudo and they have to yeah so so yeah emily goes she asks who do you know who lived there back then and you know the missus is me like i got this i'm you know she makes a beeline for this folder and while she's gone mr Gognon says she's gonna say that you shouldn't listen to me i'm crazy because uh, you know okay i do some weird things whatever it's bretudo you know and then you know the wife comes back and and she's like oh it's bread you know here here you go and and there's this thing where like she has the she has the folder so she wants to put that down on their table and she puts it down on his uh, uh, i'm guessing coffee cup and he's like look at what you did and she's like you always put your cup right in the middle of things right where we have to put things you know and it's just it's this brief glimpse into that you know yeah this old married couple argue like an old married couple you know and it's just yeah they're they're so believable like it, you know in in real life like yeah they have different last names in real life these two are not married you know and they don't have a lot of screen time but in a very short amount of time you completely get a sense of what they're like and Claude Perron plays Eva, Nino's colleague, and like she, she's kind of cynical. She's like, you know, he he kind of tries to, like she meets Emily at one point, and Nino hasn't officially met her yet. He's so so he's like, so uh, what what does she look like? Like, I guess you know, average. I, you know, like she she wasn't a dwarf, she wasn't a giraffe. I I guess average hair color. I'm not sure if she was a brunette or a blonde. Maybe she was a redhead. And and Nino's like, okay, okay, I get it. Fine, okay. You don't want to help me. Fine, you know. But just yeah. And I. I guess I will. Yeah, I th I think that is it for the the characters. Yeah. So if you're if you're if you've been on my channel for a while, you might notice this is the longest I've talked in detail about like just character traits. And it's like this movie. Like if I had done this movie, this video, like a year ago when it had been a really long time since I last watched this movie. I actually, yeah, I, f I forgot to write that down, though, so I forgot to say it. I record this video right after finishing watching the movie. But, yeah, 
I would have been, I would still have been able to tell you all this stuff because they're just, they're so memorable, all these characters. Quoting a fellow critic here, other characters than Emily are also interesting and almost, or as almost all of them evolve in a certain way. Very true. And... Yeah, so I already mentioned that there's not a lot of diversity in, in, in ethnicity, but as I've already somewhat mentioned, there is a lot of diversity in age group. You know, children, young adults, middle-aged and senior citizens. And yeah, it does actually have, like, when, when, I think that's how, yeah. When he's talking about like having this, you know, having these childhood memories, getting them back, you know, stuff he hasn't seen in in like fifty years, you know, he's he's like, I mean, where did I feel like you, you know, when I was a child, I felt like time was going forever, and now, you know, all of a sudden, I'm I'm, I'm in my fifties, you know, and just, yeah, you know, that that is. That, that is the kind of thing that someone, I'm not entirely sure, I feel like, I think Genoux himself was younger, I, I'm not 100% sure how old, so I, I, can I guess maybe he heard someone else say it, but yeah, you know, it, it feels legitimately like he, he understands and empathizes with this very different perspective. Now, the the dialogue. This is one of those cases where I don't speak the language that the movie's in, so my judgment of the dialogue will be based on the subtitles, and as such will be limited to how much of the dialogue is picked up and translated in the subtitles. It is perhaps ironic that all the words subtitles and subtleties are spelt almost exactly the same, Subtitles cannot keep up with subtleties, but yeah, it's it's absolutely amazing dialogue. Just you know, everyone has a very distinct voice, and yeah, just and obviously I cannot judge the delivery of the dialogue since I don't. Yeah, but it seems really great. The cinematography was handled by DP Uno de Bonel, and he has DP'd 21 movies. And I have to say, I'm not very familiar. Oh, right, yeah. The 2012 Dark Shadows. And... Right, yeah, he also did a very long engagement, so they worked together before. But yeah, the this is absolutely amazing cinematography, stunning beyond words. I okay, so I copied something in from the Wikipedia entry. Yeah, I will just briefly quote Wikipedia. Mise en scène. The scene where Emily plucks a stone from the ground in front of the train phantom ride is a great analysis for mise en scène. It is full of juxtapositions of color and light that emphasize the unique beauty that Emily chooses to see within the world. In this scene and throughout the movie, Emily's red starkly contrasts the sea of green, brown, and yellow behind her, separating her perspective from that of the world's. And yeah, there's a there's a lot about mise en scène, and the yeah. So let's see. yeah, quoting a fellow critic, it's a world that can be a little strange at the first time, but the cinematography manages to build a world that is at the same time real and fantastic. Now. I, I already quoted a critic as saying, you know, there, there are very few shots in the movie that had absolutely no camera movement. 
it should be exhausting. I'm sure for some people it is, but for the rest of us, it's amazing. Like, it, the movie is so alive. And the editing was handled by L.V. Schneid, who has edited 45 movies. And I, it's not a lot that I'm familiar with. He edited the young and prodigious T.S. Spivet, so they have worked together on other things than Emily. Oh, and Alien Resurrection. That one he did a great job on, as this one and that one. And Delicatessen, also a great job on that one. And, yeah, the... The editing keeps it easy to follow fast moving scenes and such. Like it's it's a very energetic movie. The the it never really stands still as such. And this like it should be just exhausting to watch. Like something I sometimes point to you know, in, in 2004, Resident Evil Apocalypse came out. That movie, when I was a teenager, I didn't find it exhausting. Today, I find it exhausting. So this movie, you know, the three years apart, this movie could easily have had the same problem. You know, and yeah, it takes a very talented editor to keep things moving fast without getting exhausting. And to you know, keep keep our interest in this. Like, the first time Emily and Nino spot each other is very early in the film. I, I, I'm not 100% certain exactly when, but it is, it's, it's quite early. And, you know, the, the, it's not a spoiler to say that they don't get together right away. So the movie has to keep keep us involved, keep, keep us wanting to see them continue to try to get together. And, yeah, d does a really excellent job. Now, the special effects are not incredible, but... There's very little of it that's, like, not convincing. There's, there's, on, there's almost none of that. There is a little bit, but almost none. And, like, the, the, there, there are times where something that they could have, like, overproduced, like, there's, there's, in, instead, they choose a fairly simple way, and it, it works really well. You know, yeah, a lot of, like, stuff that you would think might be effects, it's really just, like, careful planning and such. It's not CG or something. There, there is a little CG, and that's what's sometimes not the most convincing. The, the... Uh... Yeah, right. There's, there's this bit where Nino imagines these taped together passport photos talking to him and since like it, we are literally talking about we're, we're seeing these paper photos you know talking so some people would have said well cg you know but instead what they did was they filmed the actor who appears in the passport photos they film him talking and then they, like, in in editing, they they made it appear that the the faces talking were faces on paper. And yeah, so this was filmed in in France, and the. Yeah, various parts around France, and yeah, it, you know, 
Paris. Various parts of Paris. And it really is, like, if, if you are at all... Ah, okay, so there's some of it that's other parts of France. But, yeah, largely Paris. If you're the type of person who travels ever, this movie might make you badly want to go to France. You know, to, to Paris. And... That brings us to the next subject, the music. So the music was handled by composer Jan Tirsen, and I don't really know any of his other work as far as I, I didn't copy it in, but I think I remember not recognizing the other. He composed music for 17 short films, seven movies, including this one, four documentaries. He has three TV credits and one video credit. And the music absolutely fits. It has a strong personality as music from France, specifically from Paris. It always delivers on what's called for, whether it's happy, sad, funny, charming, etc. Incredible soundtrack. Honestly, it's worth owning and listening to independent of the movie. Although, if you're going to listen to it, I would personally say the first time you hear the music should be as you watch the movie. But after that, buy the soundtrack, listen to it all the time. It's, it's amazing. And again, like it can really cheer you up. There's some incredible sound design, like, there's this bit where, you know, I already mentioned, you know, Emily grabs the, the keys from Comunion, and, you know, at first, you don't notice, especially, you know, she, she just, she has them in her hands, she goes out, she stands from Comunion, and she's like, you know, I, I have something, you know, and, and he's like, in a minute, young lady, turns to Lucien, insults him some more, and so she hides the, the keys, and... There's this shot where she's walking and she's got the keys in her in her jacket pocket. And they they jingle like ridiculously loudly, you know, just just to I mean essentially it is the it is the movie the the audio aspect of the movie telling you she still has the keys and it's very important that she still has the keys. You know, something important is going to happen with the keys. And... And the the comedy is, is very strong. The... Yeah, I'm going to quote my overview. The comedy in the film is also extraordinary. It's so human, so light and delightful. Nothing crude, never offensive, except for, I suppose, to Puritans, and somehow sweet, like the naive little girl the film revolves around. And they do a, a great job keeping it varied. You know, there's there's a verbal, witty comedy, which, you know, if you don't speak French, you're not going to get all of But there's also some physical comedy. There are other forms of visual comedy. situational comedy you know and they they do really great delivery and yeah so you you would really think this movie just completely overdosed on quirk and became unbearable to watch like some some of scrubs as that show went on and for some people that is the case but somehow for many of us it works if you are American, or at least not European, this movie might offend your more delicate sensibilities. It is very much a French movie. I'm Danish, I'm used to this level of sexual liberty and such, but yeah, for many it will definitely be offensive, and yeah, do not show this movie to children. Now, yeah, so the pacing... I have to go a little bit in detail, I can't just say you know, this is fast-paced, this is not fast-paced. The... 
the energy of the movie is very fast and and high up there the actual pacing of the story again i already mentioned that you know for some people that will definitely you know that will be where the movie loses them it takes a while for before things really happen in, in this movie it is more about how it feels you know these these things like it is these situations of emily trying to help the people around her trying to make them happy trying to give them a happy love life and yeah the the i think that is what i said about that now the movie is one hour and 52 and a half minutes long without end credits and 56 and a half minutes long an hour 56 and a half minutes long with them and the start of the end credits is well worth paying close attention to after that you don't really have to but you know the music certainly is nice to continue to listen to i would definitely say it's well worth the investment of time now if you if you're not interested after about 30 minutes of watching the movie yeah then then the movie might just not be for you so the best element of this movie is the the charm of it and you know i i if i have to be brutally honest the the you know, I, tr I try to find both a best aspect and a worst aspect. The worst aspect of the movie is definitely, it's it's not really deep. You know, the, the movie is like candy floss. Sweet, enjoyable to consume, you may feel elated for a while after you take in the whole thing, but ultimately not filling and you may want a proper meal afterwards. I don't think that it's a big deal, but it is definitely something that, you know, it, it bothers some people. And I do think, you know, if, if there's, I, I don't think, I, I read various complaints that I didn't really think particularly made sense. But I definitely, if, if it, it is possible to make a sweet, hopeful movie that's about love. And still have more depth and have have more, you know, yeah, that, but but yeah, you know, and and I think it might like if if this is the only movie by Junior you watch, then you might think, oh, he's just not capable of depth, depth, and that's just not true, you know. Watch watch some of his his other, yeah. Now, okay, so. There's a reason why I even added the, the the section to my notes that's called Worst Aspect According to Others. And this movie this is this is this is that reason. What I read several people say was the thing they didn't like about this movie. And and some of them gave it like incredibly low scores was that it was, you know, they, they had different ways of phrasing it, but what it typically boiled down to was it's too different from American mainstream movies. And that's, I'm not saying it's for everybody. And I definitely, like, if you, if you are, let's, yeah, hypothetically, let's say that, like, you are in high school and you just got dumped by someone you thought you were going to spend your whole life with and the teacher in in French class thought this movie will delight my students and so you had to sit and watch this movie right after getting done by the you know okay I 100% empathize that that sucks but other than that like sometimes I think that some of the people who review this movie it, I I should start by saying I realize nobody is forcing me to read other people's reviews. Nobody, that that is a choice I made. And I'm not, like, 
I, I already loved this movie. It didn't make me love it more that some people had terrible reasons for criticizing it. Anyway, the the sometimes I get the feeling that some people, when they enter a user review for Metacritic, IMDb, or Rotten Tomatoes, that they feel like every movie has to be judged primarily on was this made for me personally? And if the movie wasn't made for them personally, they'll make it sound like it's just a, a sin against nature, just the worst possible thing that could happen to humanity, that there was a movie that they didn't particularly like. Like, if you, if, like, for someone to hate this movie, I could understand it if, for example, the, the French class thing that I just, that example, that hypothetical that I gave there, or if, if you think it might give some people the wrong idea about what love looks like. You know, if, if uh, yeah, stuff like that. But giving this, like, a scathingly negative review because it was different from what you're used to. Because cause that, that's what it boils down to. A lot of these people were like, I don't understand why why is the camera moving so much? Why is, I, it, why is it this mix of the fantastic and the realistic? Why is there so much color? You know, why, why is she always looking directly? In, why, why does she look directly into the camera so many times? These these kinds of things, and and it's just like, did you consider that maybe you are not the intended audience for this movie? Like, holy crap! Like, you don't see me going to like, let's see, what would be what would be an example of a movie that just is not? Let's see. I mean, I've seen some people. I, it's, I'm, I'm not sure I can right now think of a great example of, of like something that I personally, but you know, I've, I've seen some people point out why are, why are so many, you know, straight white guys complaining that this children's cartoon didn't appeal to them personally. Like it's not made for them. It's made for children, you know, which is not like, I, I think it's extremely important to be critical of children's media, not, not the media the children produce, because you you know you want to encourage them, but if if a movie is made for children and it communicates bad values, that's something that should be criticized. But if it's just like, I mean, some of them are just like you know this is a reboot, and the thing that it that the original thing that it's a reboot of, I thought that some of the characters in that were prettier than in this new one. It's like. Wow, why are you why are you like this? Please don't tell anybody that you're like this ever again. You know, just, it's, but yeah, just you know, if 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 that is if if you I think that's I'm I'm going to I'm going to go ahead and move on. It's just I'm not saying that you you're one hundred percent you're one hundred percent entitled to not like this movie. You're you're entitled to hate this movie, but giving it a negative review because it's a movie that's different from what you're used to. Like I, I think there is some chance that like some people sat down to watch this thinking it was going to be like an American romantic comedy. You know, like a a I don't know, a a pretty woman or uh 13 going on 30 something you know and and they just like i'm pretty sure you don't have to review it at all if if you just if you don't really have like if if the only thing you really have to say it are these half formed thoughts about like wow this was really i i don't understand this at all like i don't think anybody's forcing you to write anything like i or, or just just like write like, in, instead of writing, there's way too much color, just write, this has a lot of color. You know, instead of writing, this was so weird and so different, you know, just write, I found this unusual. You, you, don't, you don't have to write something negative 
just because you didn't it, it just because it wasn't personally for you. I, I just there's a there are some movies that do deserve negative reviews. Like I I've only seen clips of the room, but that one's clearly like it's technically incompetent, it's badly acted. You know, that makes sense to give a negative review to. But this, like, if if you if you legitimately think think that this is a badly made movie, wow, you have not watched enough movies to to. to anyway, I'm gonna move on. The thing I was most worried about before the first time I watched this movie was that it was gonna be too sappy, and the movie exceeded my expectations. It was not at all too sappy. The thing I was most looking forward to was Jeunet's style, since by the by the time I watched this, I had already watched Delicatessen. Oh, wait, never mind. It was only Alien Resurrection. Delicatessen I watched after this. Anyway, I'd already watched Alien Resurrection, so, yeah. And again, the movie exceeded my expectations. And... The trailers do not give too much away. I've watched multiple different ones, and none of them give too much away. And the, the trailers give you a really good impression of what the movie is like. If, if you like the movie, if you like the trailer, you'll like the movie, and if not, not. You know, the, the French trailer, the original language trailer, has lines from the movie, like most trailers do. But the American doesn't have any, and the narrator is speaking English instead of French. I, I mean, basically, I think they were hoping that people wouldn't think about that the movie was French, like, you know, was in, in French, you know, they, they, they probably figured, I mean, the average American is not going to watch a subtitled movie that's in a different language. And honestly, I think there's some chance they're right. You know what? Actually, that might help explain, you know, maybe the people who were like, I mean, when, when you read these reviews, I, I, there's no visual accompanying it. But if there was, I'm, I've, the, the image that I got was like someone tearing their hair out like, or, or like sobbing into their hands, like trying to make the world make sense again. Why are they saying words that are not in English? Why are there so, why is there so much color? Does not compute. Just this, just having a complete meltdown over a movie that just wasn't really made with them in mind, like, just, yeah. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, if you if you are used to every movie that's made being made specifically for you, I guess it would feel like the movie is just off its axis. Anyway, the cover and or poster do not give too much away and do give you a decent idea. Although, I mean, uh, there. It's right up there. There's not a lot of detail. But her smile and the way the colors pop, that does give you a really good idea of, of them. You know, those are not these toned down, subdues, broody, dark, edgy colors of, of like, you know, a, a lot of American movies, especially made after 9-11. But yeah, those are the colors of just this, you know, there's a, there's a lust for life there. Let's see. Right. The one thing is that for some reason on some covers and posters, Emily's face is very pale. Like, if it wasn't for the warmth of her smile, she could pass for an Adams family member. I have no idea why they did this. She's warm, not pale in the movie. I, again, like that, you know, my my cover the yeah, that cover really does like that that's yeah, she she's she looks so alive. I, I I do not understand why they would make her pale. It it is not at all it doesn't make any sense for them. Anyway. So on Rotten Tomatoes, this has an 89% on the tomato meter based on 186 reviews. It is a 95% audience score based on over 250,000 ratings. The consensus is uh, the feel-good Emily is a lively, fanciful charmer showcasing Audrey Tuttle as its delightful heroine. And of the 186 reviews, only 21 of them are rotten. I, I don't even know. It's it's because of the, the depth thing, I'm guessing. But yeah, anyway. 
the average rating was 8.10 out of 10. And the audience score, 95% rated it 3.5 stars or higher. And the average rating was 4.5 out of 5. This is a bit of a crowd pleaser, is, is what I'm getting at here. The movie is certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Now, let's, hmm. Is it is it not on Metacritic? Or did I just forget to copy in? I'm I'm gonna do a very quick check on my smartphone. Just in case I just forgot. It is it is possible that I simply forgot. It won't take long because Metacritic is already one of the uh, t tabs. I'm, I'm gonna go with tabs that I have open, so all I actually have to do is open that tab, and then do a search. Okay. I guess, oh, no, that's not it. Yeah, the site looks kind of messed up right now, I guess. Hmm. Oh, there it is. Okay. So, admittedly, search and huh, maybe oh no there it is there it is right so on Metacritic based the yeah so the Metascore is based on 31 reviews it is 69 nice and the user score is 7.5 based on 509 ratings on IMDb it has an 8.3 out of 10. And there are 1,553 user reviews. And the IMDb external reviews section has 147 links, and 95 of them were in the one of the two languages I speak, and not dead links. So, yeah, on, on IMDb, 25.6% voted 10. 25.1 voted 9, 24.5 voted 8, 13.4 voted 7, 5.1 voted 6, and yeah, almost no one wrote, voted less than, yeah. Those who voted 5, that's 2.3%. If you voted less than, yeah, yeah. Four or less, you are there. There's less than two percent of the over of the overall, which I, I might not have mentioned. Yeah, I don't think I mentioned before. Seven hundred thirty-three thousand four hundred seventy-seven IMDb users. So, yeah, this this is this is a this is what you might refer to as a well-received movie. And yeah, so. The, the, yeah, the, the sexuality, the sexual, uh, content in the movie, let's see, the, uh, I don't personally think there's too much, I wouldn't really call any of it inappropriate, again, as long as you keep in mind it's not for, it's not for children, it's, I, I, if anyone in, in the family is prudish, then don't watch it with them. But it is like, you know, you can watch it with family members. I've shown it to family members. It's, you know, one of one of my brothers actually, you know, he, without, he, he had already watched it. He, he walked into my room as I was watching it. And without, without like, spotting the cover, because that was out of his view, uh, you know, he just, he just, he looked at the, the TV briefly, and he was like, ah, watching Emily. And it wasn't even, like, one of the most memorable scenes or anything, you know, but it just, yeah, it's, anyway, it's that memorable. <sighs> the sexuality does not always serve a purpose and let's see yeah 
Now, that does bring, uh, oh, right, lungs, let's see, I, yeah, huh, the video isn't that going to be that much longer, it's saying that I am going to run out of storage space, because I forgot to copy the other videos I recorded from the laptop onto the external hard drive, which I will do today so that I don't run into this next week. But yeah. So yeah, the, the DVD has a director's commentary in French, of course. The 1 minute 40 second French trailer, 11 posters, 56 seconds of storyboard of the haunted house sequence. 6 minute 26 mi uh, second shooting test. The director interview that I quoted some of, which is almost 21 minutes long. 8 gnome picks. 12 minutes 45 seconds making of, it's called home movie in the DVD menu. The bloopers, which is called funny faces, which I, I don't know if that's just the French term for bloopers or if they just thought, you know, it's it's fairly accurate. You know, obviously they pull funny faces sometimes when they blow a line or something. And 15 picks by Bruno Calvo. Now, the the movie can, you, you can stream it on YouTube and Google Play. And yeah, so I rate this 10 disarmingly charming traits out of 10. Ultimately, I, I'm not sure I will, but hypothetically, I would be open to watching the movie again as soon as I hit you know, as, as soon as I stop recording this video, I, I, it is just, yeah, I, I love it, and I will never get tired of it. Now, that does bring us to the, there it is, thoughts section, and I'm just going to note, there we go. So, the rest of the video contains spoilers, and the rest of this video is not a review. This is where we get into the thoughts section, which is for my thoughts. Some of it is analysis, some of it is MSC, 3K, riff tracks, and other jokes. Now, the time codes for the sections are in the description box. The section right of this one is thoughts I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running, commentary, live tweeting, or the like. The section after that is thoughts that I had before watching. So that brings us to that first section. Once again called Notes Taken While Watching. It's so satisfying to see child Emily's revenge on the football fan who told her that she was to blame for the car accident because of the camera. You know, and it is just like, it, it, you know, when, when you, you know, she, she does, legit, you know, she's so cute. You know, she's like, oh, picture that, picture that, you know, and, and like at least one of them, like the clouds look like a teddy bear or something like, you know, just absolutely adorable. And then like there's a car accident near her and the, the guy is like, oh, there's, you know, there's something wrong with your camera. And then, you know, she's sitting there with the, with the remote and she presses and, you know, she sees all these horrible accidents. And just this adorable little child actor's face. It's just, yeah. And, you know, the, the narrator explains a few days later, she realizes that he was lying. And so she sits on his roof and she's got like the radio so she can hear when the, when the football match is getting exciting. And she sits there ready to, to pull the plug and then plug it in again. Because it wouldn't... Like, if she just pulled the plug, like, after a few seconds, he'd be like, okay, fine, I guess I'm not going to get to watch the game. But plugging it back in lets him think, ah, that was it. It's going to work from now on. I'm going to get to see the next goal. You know, and she just keeps... And, and 
you know, the, the actor who plays the football fan having to do all this, you know, act the, this physical comedy as he's having these, you know, he's trying to suppress his rage at how the cam how, how the not camera TV keeps cutting out. And I, I like the detail of this little misunderstanding of how exactly the name is spelt and pronounced. You know, is it Bretodo or Bre Bredoto? And and Emily spots adult Nino for the first time. And he's so thoroughly not used to a young woman looking at him with interest that he thinks she must be looking at something behind him. You know, he's, he's like, there's nothing, there's nothing that exciting back there. I don't, I wonder what she's looking at. You know, and Emily stands in front of someone who could definitely not be the man she's, you know, the, who has to be, you know, he must be in his 50s or something. So, you know, this guy's like maybe 30, but definitely not in his 50s. You know, so it's like, um, I, I'm i here for the, uh, you know. Oh, you poor young thing. You're just a little bit too late. You know it's a comedy when there's three dead people less than a half an hour into the movie. Like, no, count them. There's the, the Canadian tourist who takes their life. There's Emily's mother, who the Canadian tourist lands on. And now we have one of the, the people that she thought might be. Yeah. I think you need a port with some cinnamon. You know we're in France. Everywhere she goes, someone's offering her some kind of wine. It's not even afternoon yet. And it's so heartwarming when Emily helps the blind man cross the street, tells him all the things she sees, giving him some of the experience of the world around him that he hasn't had access to since he lost his sight. And Emily imagines her own funeral on TV. I love the soundscape and music when Emily takes her father's garden gnome. And the movie has a lot of what some might call coincidences, but what is clearly meant to be destiny. Emily keeps spotting Nino grabbing the ripped up passports under the machines. And Emily, you know, here's the, the thing about how, oh, you can get two regulars to fall in love. And just like immediately she acts upon it. And she reads the newspaper, decides to imitate that thing with lost letters being rediscovered. The ripped up photos of the same guy all over town is legitimately a good mystery. Like, the first time you watch the movie, you don't realize what's going on until you have all the puzzle pieces for it. Like, you might realize, you know, once the, the, let's see, ah, uh, what's it called? When, yeah, when Emily sees him standing there, you know, she, she, like, opens... Uh, it, it, what I'm saying is you might figure it out before Nino gets the full explanation, but, you know, you're not going to figure out immediately exactly what, yeah. The stuff Emily says when she knows her father isn't actually listening to the details is really funny, but also, like, super dark. And Gognon, you know, he doesn't realize yet that his watch, the, the uh, his alarm clock was set so ridiculously early. So he goes out and, you know, he's he's still sleepy, but he's like, it must be morning. So, you know, opens the thing and like, as the store is opening, like there's some cats nearby by like a, a trash can. And they were like, what's, what's, what's with these humans? We usually get at least some more peace around this time. You know, it really is a hilarious misunderstanding with the phone number. Nino didn't leave his own number, his home number, because he's at work most of the day. But he also didn't write, this is not the number for my home, it is the number for my work, 
please ask for Nino. So when she calls the number and says it's about the ad, the person on the other line of the phone, he thinks that it's the ad for working with them. And so he starts asking about the the amount of, of hair in a certain part of her. Just, wow. And that is why you should definitely not watch this with anyone who is not yet of age, because they really should not be, start wondering... Why was he like, there shouldn't be that much hair around the navel? Why would there be? Just, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and the moment she hears that, she's like, you know, she's like, what was that? Just <laughs> like for like a second or two, she looks like she might never pick up a phone again. Like that was horrifying. <laughs> you know, because she, she does realize what he's talking about. You know, it, it's she. She didn't expect to hear it, but once he starts talking about hair up to the navel, you know, she's she's naive. She's not like she she can still figure that out, and she's like, that does not have anything to do with our little quest to figure out about the mystery man. So that there's something wrong there. It is really adorable when, you know, Luthien apparently brought stuff that uh, Raymond isn't interested in, but he actually just used it to hide stuff Raymond really does want, and he uncovers one after another, and, you know, Raymond is like, oh, you're my favorite magician, or something like that. I, you know, we, we see... Ah, jo I'm gonna yeah, Joseph and Georgette, you know, have sex in the the cafe bathroom without having gone on a single real date because this is France. And you know that's that's when like the the if if you try to watch this with a Puritan, you know the the orgasmic screams of Georgette will not be as loud as the shrieks of horror from the Puritan when that scene comes on. So, you know, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying wear earplugs. Don't do it. Don't. That's, that's... Unless they're mean. To be like Emily. Treat people the way that they deserve to be treated. I love all the shots of, like, glasses and stuff bouncing because of the intensity of the sex. And in the haunted house ride, Nino is trying to scare Emily, but because she's attracted to him, and she's not used to being so close to a man that, you know, in, in general, but especially not one that she's attracted to, she instead has this positive reaction. I really love that when Nino imagines the passport photos talking to him, most of the time they're saying different things. I got a real, you know, countless screams of Neo vibe there. But when, you know, there's just a couple of things that they do say in unison, and, the, you know, that's given a special impact then. That's, yeah, it gives, it has a special impact. There we go. Got there eventually. And Nino follows the arrows and everything, and then he sees Emily at his bike giving back the photo album. And it's like, I wanted to talk to you. I didn't just want the photo album, but, you know, but she did leave a message in the photo. And, and then he plasters the 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 answer up it's, yeah it is really nice seeing Georgette so happy it's too bad it doesn't last I really love the sequence where we see Emily cut up the letters reassemble it into the forged love letter and she like ah it ages it I, f I forget what it's called but yeah you know to make it look like a real letter since Collignon keeps insisting on being so mean to Lucien, you know, seeing Emily's revenge on him is supremely satisfying. And, you know, evidently she has to keep, you know, doing revenge things on, you know, against him. Because the, the, uh, what's the word? He, he hasn't learned yet. He still, he's still so, so mean to him. Excellent build up to the reveal of the man in the ripped up photos. Like, you know, he steps off the, the bike and you see him walking, and the 
cuts to, to Emily and cuts back. It's, it's just, yeah. It's so sweet when Madeline reads the forged letter. And that's a part where I really wish I understood French, but I do get a little bit of, because they like, they kind of did with the audio what she did with the letters and and assemble it from all these different i mean they must have actually recorded the different letters and then reassembled it in editing because it doesn't sound like it's just a person reading aloud something out in in one but yeah you know and and it is legitimately they they did a great she did a great job of of making it so you know there's like so so for example you know in in the love letter that she read to to Emily is the you know uh the 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 woman of my dreams or something like that and then you know in in this forced love letter it says you know suddenly the woman means the the woman he eloped with instead of madeline so and and the the let's see yeah just various things that yeah poor luthien even raymond snaps at him and emily took a passport photo of herself and ripped it up so nino would find it Poor Georgette, now Joseph's upset with her. And Emily imagines a ridiculous set of circumstances for why Nino hasn't shown up. And Emily is shown skipping stones. Thankfully, no giant rat is around. And by the time Nino actually finds the note that they... Uh, I, yeah, it wasn't... Uh, it was Gina, I think. Gina put in his jacket pocket. It's He's almost late for the meetup. I love the sound work when you, when you, when, when Nino finds the, what is that? Yeah, the, the passport photos of the mystery man. Yeah. And Nino is overjoyed at, at, at having the answer. And the mystery man is very confused by this large smile on this, like, why is, why is he so happy about, you know, just. Anyway, I gotta move on to the next thing to repair. 405. Evidence of female conspiracy. Wow. Joseph. Wow. And poor Georgette. Joseph just won't leave her alone. Poor Emily thinking that... Uh, was, wait. I wrote Suzanne. I, I think I meant G Gina. It's, yeah, Gina. Stole Nino, which is you know, and, and you understand because it's like oh, every man wants uh, uh, Gina. Such a strong contrast between Madeline being so happy because of the letter and Emily being so sad because of this misunderstanding. In Emily's romantic fantasy of Nino bringing her, I want to say it's called yeast. Luthien commands Colignon rather than the other way around, which I quite like. Just just that little detail. Oh Golion, go go pick it up for him. Yeah. And and Golion doesn't even argue. He's just Yes boss. And and like that bit where like he, em, Emily is imagining that Nino is right there behind her, you know, and then the, the little uh I don't know what they're called. The the thing that it's not like a door, but there's like hanging beads, whatever. It kind of moves just like she imagines it from him moving and she turns around it's the cat when there's nothing separating them except the door we so badly want her to just open it it's so sweet when she opens the door and he's right there like you know before it was like oh no he's he's gone and when will he be back it's just yeah Nino and Emily Emily are absolutely adorable together. They share very little screen time, but every moment of it is powerful. I especially love that drive there at the end when they're both on the bike. And just a few seconds before the movie ends, both of them break the fourth wall. It's not the first time she does it, but it is the first time he does it. You know, now they're connected, so yeah. And that brings me to the final section.
notes taken before watching. I don't really want a sequel to this, but I would like a spiritual successor. If, if anybody knows movies similar to this, please put them in, in the comments. I, yeah. I'm not going to quote every single line I love from this movie. I'm just going to say I love every line in the IMDb quote section. Just, you know, you can look that up instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. I do recommend that you read at least some of them since if you watch this and you don't speak French, the subtitles might not catch everything. Certainly mine don't. And... Yeah, so I... I'm glad that the movie doesn't really have empathy for Colignon and the, the football fan because it really is like it's, it's so unnecessary you know just have have some empathy you know, the, the football fan has no empathy for eight-year-old Emily and Colignon has no empathy for the fan yeah I, th I think I basically got it right so yeah usually I you know, I myself empathize with basically everyone, but I do think sometimes movies should. Because that's also like, you know, again, I don't think any children should watch this. But hypothetically, if somehow, like, you know what? I guess it's possible to censor this movie to a point where children should. Children, children would basically be able to, to watch it. You know, I mean, okay, so... None of the none of the deaths, none of the sex shop stuff, none of the sex stuff in general. Let's see. I guess yeah, some of the some of the darker comedy gone. And yeah, it's it's doable. I don't think it's as good of a movie, but it's doable. Those children would then take away, you know, okay, don't be cruel to the the innocent. Now, let's see. Right, so the... Let's see. According to... Huh, is this... Okay, I'm not entirely sure. I, f I forget if this was... Actually, yeah, thinking about it, I think both the IMDb Frequently Asked Questions and Wikipedia explain, you know, the roaming gnome did not originate in this movie. The traveling gnome was inspired by a rash of similar pranks played out in England and France in the 1990s. In 1997, French court convinced the leader of the Front de Libération des Marines de Jardin, Garden Gnome Liberation Front, of, wait, convicted, not convinced, wow, of stealing over 150 gnomes. The idea was later used in an advertising campaign for an internet travel agency. And, yeah, according to IMDb trivia, it was in 1974 that Jean-Pierre Jeuneux began collecting the memories and events that make up the story of Emily. So, over... Well, let's see, what does that make? 26 years or so that, yeah. Whenever this film was shot on location, Jean Jeuneux and the crew would clean the area of debris, grime, trash, and graffiti so that the real settings would match the fantastic nature of the film. This was an especially difficult task when it came time to shoot at the huge train station. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, so the one quote that I copied in, I just, you, you gotta... The subtitles, my subtitles, did not pick up. I, th I think it maybe picked up half of this. So, Georgette, screaming after Emily spills tea on her. Bravo, vive la France, you scolded me. Bravo, 10 out of 10, 10 out of 10, bullseye. I mean, I think I'll, I'll give, I, you know, I'll, I'll briefly translate from Danish to English what some of the subtitles did say. And so, you know, the the uh let's see one of the, oh yeah yep yeah, sorry bullseye is already there anyway the yeah one that wasn't it's a a plus uh, perfect grade something like that you know 
And that might actually, yeah, I did not. Hmm. Maybe I'll just, yeah, I'm not sure I'm going to put the time codes for the for both sections since section the second section was so short. Anyway, it, go into the com please go into the comments. Let me know what is your favorite movie that's similar to this one, or you know, if if you think that this movie would have been a lot better if you know something was changed, you know, let me know what you yeah, what you think should have been changed. If you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two, or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week, reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie, and one talking about the most recent episode of The Mandalorian that I personally watched. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my video next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. And I will catch you next time.